Hi, this is Health Powered Productivity by RaiderCo. We're revitalizing productivity and banishing burnout through practical, tailored tools, healthy, sustainable habits, and coaching accountability. Declutter your mind, body, and life one habit at a time. I'm your productivity lead, Marcy Raider, with your next bite sized nugget of knowledge. The health, food, and exercise industry can be frustrating. It's hard to keep up with science, the media, and the latest trendy diet. It's essential to understand a few things before you want to throw your hands up in the air and wave them like you just don't care and give up. Recommendations will change. The more research and science we get to back up our information, the better we can recommend something. This is a good thing. However, Much of what you read online or hear in 30 second sound bites is a misinterpretation of the data. They're not going to tell you that the study on eating chocolate before bed was done on rats or as few as 10 people. It's insignificant. That's not even news at all, but it's news to you and it's great clickbait. They may also not tell you that a particular study was only done on men. For example, most intermittent fasting studies which don't have the same effects with premenopausal women. It may also not tell you that the study wasn't really done without bias, like the most famous study on being vegetarian, the China study, which was cherry-picked by T. Colin Campbell. It failed to mention the county of Tuoli, where 45% of the diet was fat. They ate twice as much, much animal protein a day as the average American and rarely ate plants. They were extremely healthy with low rates of cancer and heart disease. Somehow this was not included in the data. There are entire essays and even a book debunking the study, but still it's referenced all the time. There are other benefits to eating a plant-based diet. You don't have to manipulate your data to find them. There are also a lot of politics, a lot of politics behind food studies and recommendations. The old food guide pyramid was influenced mainly by the meat and dairy industry. I mean, really, there is no dietary requirement for dairy. I'm not against dairy. I have it every day. But that pyramid made it look like you needed to eat two to four servings a day. And my plate is only slightly better. So indulge me as I share three things that I used to believe and don't anymore. But unfortunately, the masses still do. One, eggs are bad for you and cause high cholesterol. Oh, to the contrary. Do you know why we have this terrible advice that won't go away? In the 60s, Ansel Keys, who is a physiologist from Cambridge, decided that foods with cholesterol must cause high cholesterol. He cherry picked seven countries to follow. You see a trend here? That supported his hypothesis and left out countries that didn't. He also checked the diet for only a single day for the average American. He only checked food samples for fats and less than 4% of the 12,000 participants he studied. And evidently, he was in bed with the American Heart Association, who ignored at least six studies at the same time that did not show this animal fat cholesterol connection. It actually showed that it didn't. I could go on and on about this, but I'll let you do your research. For decades, we have known that eggs are not bad for you and will not give you high cholesterol, but yet this rumor will not go away. I eat about four to eight eggs a week and my cholesterol is stellar. My HDL is the same as my LDL. My doctor said she'd never even seen that before. And if you think I have good genes, that's actually not the case. There are definitely cholesterol issues in my family, but you know what actually does contribute to high cholesterol? Sugar. Two, it's all about the total number of calories. I've tracked my food on my fitness pal for years, maybe 10 years. I don't know, a long, long time. And I like it. In the beginning, it was more for total calories. I was training for ultra races and I wanted to make sure I was eating enough, excuse me, but I still wasn't still. It's also never about total calories. 
The type of calories you eat plays a massive role in how your body processes them. An ultra processed food like a tortilla chip is a carb, but it has little to no fiber and is so easily digestible, it will spike your blood sugar. On the other hand, an apple is also a carb, but doesn't have the same composition that it will have an identical effect. The energy balance model states that if we eat excessive carbohydrates with added sugars, corn syrup, and refined grains, which was my diet of choice in my 20s and 30s, it will actually change our hormonal balance in a way that makes our body store more fat. High fructose consumption can force the liver to create fatty acids and drive insulin resistance. A calorie is not a calorie. Resistant starch resists digestion in the small intestine and ferments in the large intestine. This makes them act like a prebiotic and feeds the good bacteria in your gut. Because it's not digested in the small intestine, it doesn't raise your blood sugar as much. You can get this, or at all, you can get this from plantains, green bananas, beans, peas, lentils, oats, and cooked and cooled rice. Yes, cooling and reheating oats and rice allows it to function differently in your body, which is fascinating to me. Also, the timing of your calories matters. Due to hormones throughout the day, activity throughout the day, and other factors, your body may process some foods better in the morning than at night and produce less of an insulin spike. Time-restrictive eating, even for as much as 12 hours, which means only eating in a 12-hour window, so like your first meal at 7.30 a.m. and you end your dinner by 7.30 p.m., can have really positive benefits. And these benefits can increase with 10, 8, and even 6-hour windows. Still, for premenopausal females, I would not recommend going below an 8-hour window. Now, I don't practice this all the time and choose instead to work out fasted first thing in the morning, which tends to give the same benefits. I am a postmenopausal woman and I have been for uh, 11 years now, but time restrictive eating, you know, time type, it's not total calories. But something else I've changed my mind on is to never eat before bed. I would hear, you know, I've heard this for years since I was little, don't eat right before you go to bed. I used to go to bed hungry, not sleep well, and get up in the middle of the night and not be able to go back to sleep. So sometimes I'll have a snack an hour before go before I go to bed, which I go to bed super early, like nine, between nine and nine thirty. And sometimes I'll have it right before bed if I'm starting to feel hungry and I'm afraid that I'll wake up. Sleep is more important to me. Now, what I choose to eat is very important, and that has definitely changed. In the past, I'd have a banana or when I used to eat bread, you know, I'd have bread, um, have a piece of toast or something, um, and that would spike my blood sugar. So I prefer to eat a protein pudding, which um, consists of a scoop of collagen or protein powder mixed with peanut butter or almond butter, and maybe a little bit of almond or um, coconut milk, sometimes just hot water, but it's just a little, my little protein pudding and it feels like dessert to me. Other times I'll have about half a cup of cottage cheese. And I used to um, take tortilla chips and dip into that cottage cheese until I did a study. Um, I wore a continuous glucose monitor and did a study um, testing my blood sugar levels. It was a study for healthy people and testing blood, blood sugar in healthy people. And whoa, did um, tortilla chips spike my blood sugar. And I'm sure it was, it came all down to that. It, it is an ultra processed food. And I was hopeful that the grain-free tortilla chips wouldn't do it, but they did it just the same. So now tortilla chips are just um, a treat for me. They're not something that I eat at home, something that I eat when I'm out. Um, so I digress. Um, the, so now I just will have like, sometimes I have a cup of cottage cheese, but either way I keep it at 200 calories or less. Sometimes I'll just have a tablespoon of nut butter and that's it. But I stick with foods that are easy to digest and are more protein and fat focused than carb. And this snack also helps me get in a good workout in the morning before I break that fast. 
you know, not eating before I work out is also something that I've learned. And I talked about that in one of the very first episodes of the podcast. The last one is to exercise hard all the time. In my 20s, I taught a lot of aerobics. Then I started running marathons. In my 30s, I was a triathlete and mountain biker and venture racer. I raced up to 100 mile mountain bike races on a single speed. I did Ironmans. And my longest adventure race was 38 hours. And for me, a day off was an hour long, easy bike ride or an easy 45 minute run. And I hated every minute of them because it was easy. But for the last seven years, I've tracked my heart rate variability using an aura ring and taken um, or, or another device, but in the last few years, the aura ring. And I take easy days when it tells me I might be overreaching and I mix it up a lot more with um, easier to more demanding workouts. I'm not just going hard all the time. And I pretty much work out about an hour a day, usually in the morning. And then I sprinkle in movement opportunities throughout the day, walking meetings, walking phone calls, pull-ups, push-ups. Um, I ride my fit bike while I'm watching webinars. Sometimes I'll read on my fit bike and I'll spend 20 to 40 minutes daily in my infrared sauna. Shifting from this mindset was really hard. I felt lazy. Now I can't imagine, nor do I want to spend four to six hours biking on a Saturday or three hours running on a Sunday. I much prefer shorter workouts with more variety. I believe, I truly believe all those long miles, cold runs, and never letting my body recover are big contributing factors to getting Hashimoto's disease, which I manage really well, but could easily slip backward by exercising too much or not enough. And I also lift more weights, heavy ones. <laughs> there you have it. Just a few things I used to believe that I don't anymore. What has changed in your mind? What have you learned in the last few years that you thought the opposite was true when you were younger? Want more bite-sized health-powered productivity tips? Please subscribe. And if you like it, let us know by leaving a review. Want more? Say hello to Raider Co. at www.helloraiderco.com.